Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. With your host, Linnea Hubbard. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. I'm Linnea Hubbard and today is Saturday, November 19th, 2022. It's been 3,188 days since Russia occupied Crimea on February 27, 2014, and 269 days since the large-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Today's podcast looks at what happened yesterday in the Russia-Ukraine war. The Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War update is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from direct contacts in Ukraine and their proxies, Russian Ministry of Defense reports, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reports, Operational Command South of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geolocation experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian mill bloggers and social media accounts with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, to report the truth, because the truth matters. Let's start with our assessment of the current status of the war. First, our assessment that 50% of Ukrainian energy infrastructure had been destroyed after missile attacks launched from October 10th to November 17th was accurate. Second, we maintain that the slowdown in combat operations on multiple axes is a mirage, with intense fighting creating little progress. Both belligerents have significant military assets they can reallocate to new axes. Third, we maintain that neither belligerent will institute a winter pause. Fourth, we maintain that President Putin's inner circle is actively targeting Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu for dismissal and replacement due to continued military failures in Ukraine. Fifth, we maintain that Russian President Vladimir Putin is facing renewed unrest inside and outside the Kremlin. If there continue to be military failures, there is a remote chance Russia could face a regime change. Sixth, we maintain that the Russian military within Ukraine is combat ineffective and can only mount effective defensive operations. Seventh, we maintain that the private military company Wagner Group is spread too thin due to its expanding role in the Donetsk Oblast and the revelation of crippling battlefield losses. Eighth, we maintain that Ukraine holds the battlefield initiative forcing Russian troops to remain in a defensive posture. And finally, we maintain that Russian forces in Belarus remain a credible threat for an invasion of western Ukraine, but now assess the possibility has pushed further out to the next 50 to 80 days. Let's get some regional updates, starting with Kherson and Zaporizhia. The situation in Kherson and Zaporizhia remains unchanged, with both belligerents trading artillery and rocket strikes and Russian forces continuing to build defensive positions far behind the line of conflict. Russian forces continued to shell the liberated territory, including Kherson and the suburbs of Chornobaivka, Antonivka and Biloserka. Further east, the towns of Tokarivka, Mikulaivka, Odradokamyanka, Cherevonimayak, Milova and the city of Bereslav were shelled. Poor weather hampered Russian forces' use of drones for scouting and artillery direction. The first train to Kherson since February 24th departed from Kyiv and arrived several hours later to cheering crowds. In less than a week, Ukrainian engineers repaired the looted station and reconnected electricity, water, and communications to return passenger rail service. Family members who had separated for eight months reunited with emotional scenes repeated on the station platform. Video emerged of a Ukrainian soldier weeping uncontrollably after arriving in Kherson, his hometown, and realizing the city was free. You'll want a tissue for that one. American reporters with ABC News visited Chornobaivka and showed that the airport, which was repeatedly attacked for months by artillery and airstrikes, is covered in destroyed Russian military equipment. In southeastern Kherson, Ukrainian forces continue to pound Russian positions and logistic nodes using rockets fired by HIMARS. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, confirmed a HIMARS strike on Russian barracks in Mikhailivka. 
It was reported up to 40 Russian troops were killed and another 70 were wounded. Another troop concentration was struck also in Skadovsk, with up to 50 Russian troops killed. In Chaplinka, 14 kilometers north of the Kherson Crimea administrative border, an ammunition depot was destroyed. In Novakakhovka, photos emerged showing the remains of a hotel destroyed last week that housed Russian troops. In Zaporizhia, rescuers found more bodies in a destroyed two-story apartment building in Vilnyansk. I'll have more information on that for you in the War Crimes and Human Rights segment. Russian missiles struck Zaporizhia, with Ukrainian sources reporting that an industrial complex was targeted. Russian sources claim it was the Motor Siege plant, which was unconfirmed at the time of recording. A short video did show a large fire, but geolocation was impossible. In Prishib, Zaporizhia, Russian forces staged looted engineering equipment and used the area's industrial facilities to build more defensive structures. Some assessment here. Russian forces continue to build defensive positions deep in Kherson and Zaporizhia. While some of this activity is likely occurring due to oncoming winter season, the concern about a Ukrainian counteroffensive appears to be pretty high. Ukrainian interdiction efforts are likely causing additional logistical problems and are probably more extensive than reported. Video released by the 110th Territorial Defense Brigade of Ukraine showed the unit firing 82mm mortars on Russian positions in Novodarivka, which is on the Donetsk-Zaporizhia administrative border. Russian troops were located in well-established positions with a defensive trench line within the settlement. Based on the social intelligence, we adjusted our war map, moving the line of conflict about one kilometer west to show that Russian troops had occupied the town. This does not represent a new offensive. The situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains unchanged, and no information has been released about the employee that Russian occupiers kidnapped over six weeks ago. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, released its strongest resolution to date, calling for the withdrawal of Russian troops and equipment from ZNPP. The 35-member board of directors approved the statement, which declared that the facility belongs to Ukraine and called for Russia to leave the plant immediately. The resolution passed with 24 in favor, 2 opposed, and 7 abstaining, with China and Russia voting against it, and Kenya, Namibia, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and Vietnam abstaining. Kremlin Press Secretary Dmitry Peskov said that Russian leaders would continue to, quote, communicate with the IAEA, but did not share a formal response to the resolution. After the vote, Russian state media called the IAEA inspections for dirty bombs inadequate, stating that only two inspectors went to each facility for a few hours. It is worth noting that the Kremlin dropped the rhetoric claiming Ukraine was making dirty bombs almost a month ago and was planning a false flag attack in Mykolaiv. There was scattered artillery fire from the Zaporizhia Donetsk administrative border to Huliapola to Orekhiv to Mali Shirbaki. Now to the Donbass region, starting with southwest Donetsk. There remains conflicting information on the status of Pavlivka. A video showed Ukrainian forces firing from BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicles outside of the settlement, close to Volodar. Russian forces fired white phosphorus and thermite on Volodar, likely setting conditions for an upcoming advance. Quick sidebar here. The second video I just mentioned, which we link to on Twitter and in our full situation report on Patreon, vividly shows the difference between white phosphorus and thermite for do-it-yourself open-source intelligence evaluation. At the start of the video, orange glowing streaks fall from the sky much faster and with more trailing smoke than the white charges, which look a lot like fireworks. The orange, fast-dropping smoking munitions are white phosphorus, which isn't as dispersed as the thermite. The GSAFU reported that the 1st Army Corps of the DNR continued to throw troops at the eastern outskirts of Novomikhailivka without any change in the situation. Russian forces continue their attempts to advance on Nevelske and remain at least 1,600 meters from the Ukrainian firebase. Geolocated video showed Russian tanks, which were located in the gray area east of the village, 
being destroyed by light infantry using javelin missiles. Russian forces have made little to no progress into Peribomaisky, with a Russian video showing three tanks with the Donetsk People's Republic, or DNR, First Army Corps, firing on Ukrainian positions. The tanks were located just west of the E-50 Ring Road stronghold on the pisky peribomaisky border. Russian forces have been stuck in this area along the destroyed highway since October. Ukrainian forces reportedly withdrew from Opitne, while one source maintains that Russian troops are, quote, contained. Based on multiple reports and despite the conservative nature of the Ukrainian source Deep State, we consider Opitne under Russian control. Russian forces attempted to capitalize on their tactical gain with a failed advance on Vodyana. The Ukrainian National Resistance Center reported that Colonel General and aspiring dentist Don Don Ramzan Kadyrov is expanding his administrative control in the Donetsk Oblast. After the sham annexation of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson, collaborators are being replaced en masse with Russian Gauleiters. Among recent arrivals to Donetsk to take over roles is the Chechen Minister of Information, Akhmet Dudayev. Chechen influence is almost certainly why the DNR People's Militia Channel has become a source of fan fiction. Speaking of, the DNR People's Militia Public Relations Channel claimed they destroyed another 18 pieces of Ukrainian military equipment, including six tanks, in the Donetsk Oblast. The Russian Ministry of Defense reported three Ukrainian tanks destroyed theater-wide, only one of which was in Donetsk. Ukrainian forces increased the shelling of Donetsk, striking the Leninsky and Kiev districts, School 13, and the Donbass Arena. We had noted over the summer that geolocated video showed the buildings around the arena were being used for ammunition storage. However, there weren't any secondary explosions related to the strike, and the damage was light. The administrative buildings of the Waters of Donbass public utility in Donetsk were shelled, causing moderate damage. Most residents have not had access to potable or technical water for months. DNR officials continued to laugh at the concept of operational security, or OPSEC, and provided a battle damage assessment of the railroad infrastructure in Ilovaisk. The photos, all of which feature a Russian soldier who reminds me very much of Droopy Dog holding a piece of paper with the date on it, show the damage to the rails and debris in incredible detail. Social media reports claim that Horlivka was shelled, with a picture showing multiple smoke columns rising in the distance. Customers of Ukrainian cellular company Phoenix woke up to find their phones were roaming and using the megaphone Russia network. Russia has been transferring cellular and internet providers in the occupied territories of Ukrainian networks. The interconnected electrical networks between the occupied territories and free Ukraine continue to cause problems, with over 30,000 households in Donetsk without power after additional Russian strikes on Ukrainian electrical infrastructure. In one neighborhood, residents protested the lack of heat, electricity, and water. Insurgents in Mariupol reported a large explosion in the city, but didn't provide additional details. An estimated 10 to 15,000 Russian troops have been stationed in Mariupol and the surrounding towns since October. Russian troops that retreated from Kherson have been stationed in Yuryivka, on the coast of the Azov Sea. Chechen forces have taken up security duty in the city center, led by a Russian-assigned Gauleiter. We maintain that Chechen forces are dangerous to Ukrainians, Russians, collaborators, themselves... The boost of Chechen influence in Mariupol aligns with earlier promises by the Kremlin that Chechen leaders would be given control of the city. In northeast Donetsk, on the Donetsk-Luhansk administrative border, positional fighting on the eastern edge of Verknokamyanskia continued. Fighting for control of Bilohorivka, the one in Donetsk, and Spirna, led by private military company or PMC Wagner Group, continued with no change in the situation. There was no reported change in the situation around Solidar and Bakhmut, with continued fighting. Geolocated video that some viewers might find disturbing showed that Russian forces continued to be held back along the E-40 highway east of Bakhmut. Fighting has continued in this area since August, and the video was geolocated exactly on our current line of conflict. 
Our map editor was feeling pretty smug about that. Another video showed Ukrainian forces in central Solidar walking around without concern and with no sounds of artillery or small arms fire. It isn't unexpected that Ukrainian troops are in the city center, but the video provides strong evidence that Russian troops have not advanced into the eastern districts and are engaged in street fighting. The GSAFU reported that Ukrainian forces repelled attacks on Klishivka and Zelenopilia, south of Bakhmut. Claims from the DNR that Mayorsk had been captured, with supporting pictures, appear to have been another Kremlin picture report to claim victory prematurely. Russian mill blogger Rybar reported, quote, DPR People's Militia Units are advancing on Mayorsk, end quote, indicating they were pushed out or never had a firm hold of the railroad station in the first place. This is why we have trust issues. Moving on to Luhansk, drone video showed that Ukrainian forces attacked Russian positions south of Novoselivsk, located on the P-7G lock. That's a ground line of communication, or supply line. The video, which some people may find disturbing, showed Russian tanks, troops, and military vehicles being attacked by drones with impunity. In one part of the video, Russian troops abandoned their wounded in a shallow ditch. As with most of the videos we mention, we do link to it in our full situation report on Patreon. Russian forces reportedly attempted to recapture Selmakhivka about 13 kilometers west of Svatova. They were unsuccessful. Only three kilometers west of Svatova, a Russian Tor M2 anti aircraft missile complex system was destroyed. War Gonzo reported positional fighting around Bilohorivka, the one in Luhansk. Serhi Haidai, Luhansk Oblast administrative and military governor, toured Makhivka and Nevelskate today and helped distribute humanitarian aid. Despite the continued shelling, Haidai reported that some residents of Makhivka are refusing to evacuate for the winter. Haidai also reported that some of the most experienced Russian troops from Kherson have arrived in Luhansk to help reinforce the defensive lines. Some assessment here? We're surprised that the Russian Ministry of Defense appears to have elected to distribute the troops withdrawn from Kherson to multiple locations, including Mariupol, Donetsk, east of Bakhmut in Donetsk Oblast, and into Luhansk. This is a shift in Russian military doctrine, which previously concentrated forces into a small area to push Ukrainian troops out at any expense. While the distribution of forces is a sounder decision, it will minimize the impact of the redeployed forces from Kherson. The Luhansk People's Republic, or LNR, 2nd Army Corps, also ignored OPSEC and provided battle damage assessment pictures of a HIMARS strike on Brianka that destroyed a Russian command and control center. The Chechen influence spread to Luhansk, where local prosecutors were replaced by a close ally of Kedirov, Gleb Mikhailov, who brought his own prosecutor team with him. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers and analysts is funded by readers, listeners and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. In the Cherniev, Kharkiv and Sumy region, Dmitro Zhivitsky, Sumy Oblast administrative and military governor, reported the Hromadas of Shalekhin, Seredina Buda, Bilopilia and Snobnovhorodsk were attacked from across the international border. Russian forces fired grad rockets from multiple launch rocket systems, or MLRS, artillery and mortar rounds. In Shalekhin, some farm buildings were damaged, with no injuries reported. In the Black Sea, Crimea, Mykolaiv, and Odessa region, an artillery or rocket attack destroyed a Russian military base and observation post on the Kinburn Spit. Back in October, Russian troops fired from this location on tugboats and a barge hauling grain, killing two people. Poor weather has forced most ships in the Black Sea fleet to return to port. A single kilo-class submarine capable of launching up to four caliber cruise missiles remained on patrol near the area of Snake Island. There were renewed reports of a strike on the Russian airbase at Zhankoi in occupied Crimea, but exactly none of them came from reliable sources. So, moving on to western and central Ukraine, 
The shelling of Nikopol in the Dnipropetrovsk Oblast continued, with up to 60 Grad rockets fired by MLRS striking the city, as well as Mirivska and Marchanets. Russian forces stayed true to form, targeting civilian housing and power lines. Valentin Reznichenko, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast military and administrative governor, reported the attack caused no injuries. On the Russian front, Russian state media reported a Ukrainian unmanned surface vessel, or USV, struck the oil terminal in Novorossiysk, which is in Russia's Krasnodar Krai federal district. The reports and videos on social media showing the blast at the port were later removed. If a USV caused the blast, the vessel traveled at least 650 kilometers from the closest potential launch point. The explosion occurred in Tsemes Bay at the 8th berth, which is controlled by the Russian company Transneft. Officials deny that there was an incident at the port. The Russian village of Ustinka was shelled, with no reports of injuries. Russian sources reported the town of Balaya Bereska in the Bryansk Federal District was also shelled, with Ukrainian forces targeting the electrical substation. A video shared on social media appeared to record the sound of a small arms depot detonating in the distance, separate from the fire at the electrical substation. Let's talk about developments theater-wide and outside Ukraine. Sweden announced they had completed their investigation into the destruction of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines and concluded it was an act of, quote, gross sabotage. Sweden's public prosecutor's office announced that investigators found, quote, traces of explosives on several, quote, foreign objects at the blast site at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Swedish officials did not blame any individuals or nation for the attack and said they were continuing to review more details as several other nations and NATO officials continue their own investigations. United States State Department spokesperson Vedant Patel said that Russia can't win its war in Ukraine, adding, quote, We urgently call on Russia to withdraw its forces to end a needless war, end quote. He added that Russian tactics had become, quote, despicable and desperate, and added that the United States remains, quote, unwavering in its support of Ukraine to defend, quote, their country and their freedom. In a recorded statement at the Halifax International Security Forum, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky rejected growing pressure to call a short truce with Russia, saying, quote, Russia is now looking for a short truce, a respite to regain strength. Someone may call this the war's end, but such a respite will only worsen the situation. Immoral compromises will only lead to new blood. End quote. He continued, adding that a, quote, honest peace can only be achieved by, quote, the complete demolition of Russian aggression, end quote. The Russian Federation violated the Budapest Memorandum, the Minsk Protocol, and the Minsk II Peace Agreement, giving the Ukrainian government little faith that a temporary ceasefire would hold. Some assessment here. We have maintained since the wide-scale invasion of Ukraine that the Western allies can stop this now in Kyiv or fight this in Berlin or Paris in another five to ten years. The Russian Federation has shown no indications that they are prepared for honest peace negotiations that won't end with Ukraine being attacked at a later date when Russian forces have regrouped and the geopolitical situation has potentially become more favorable. President Zelensky reported that engineers are working around the clock to repair Ukrainian natural gas and electrical infrastructure. As we estimated in yesterday's episode, Almost 50% of Ukraine's electrical network was destroyed by the attacks that started on October 10th. Some stability is being restored. On November 17th, blackouts were rolling across the entire nation, while yesterday it was limited to 17 regions, including the city of Kyiv. The hardest-hit regions included Venetia, Ternopil, Odessa, and Kyiv. And today, emergency blackouts are not expected to be needed. The United Nations condemned the continued attacks, saying that electricity and water shortages risk creating a, quote, humanitarian disaster this winter, end quote. Russian President Vladimir Putin personally attended the meeting of the Security Council of Russia for the first time since the start of the so-called special military operation, which isn't so special anymore. 
Russian state media reported it was the first time the meeting was held face-to-face since the COVID pandemic began. The council discussed improving Russian civil defense as the nation plays political theater with its population that Ukraine and its allies will attack it. While Russia repeats, don't force us to use nukes, for months, NATO has taken a silent approach to deterrent force using more conventional means. Five NATO carrier battle groups are patrolling European waters, including the USS George H.W. Bush, the USS Gerald Ford, the British Royal Navy's MHS Queen Elizabeth, France's Charles de Gaulle, and Italy's ITS Cavour. NATO Allied Maritime Command Vice Admiral Keith Blunt said, quote, Five carriers within our operating area present a further opportunity to consolidate our approach to air defense, cross-domain cooperation, and maritime land integration, end quote. The Gerald Ford is the newest aircraft carrier in the United States fleet, commissioned in October 2021. It isn't unusual to have multiple carrier strike forces operating around European waters, but the timing of five deployments is interesting. Russia had another spy defect to the West. Artem Zinchenko was assigned to Estonia, was captured, imprisoned, and freed in 2018 as part of a prisoner exchange, and in October, he fled the Russian Federation back to Estonia. Zinchenko claims he fled because Putin's leadership has, quote, all the aspects of totalitarianism, end quote. Ukrainian state-run weapons company Ukroboronprom announced it would start producing and developing heavy weapons in cooperation with six NATO nations, including Poland, the Czech Republic, France, and Denmark. Two other partner nations requested the details of their partnership not be disclosed. A spokesperson with Ukroboronprom said, quote, We are creating joint defense companies, building close-cycle ammunition production lines, jointly producing armored vehicles and multiple launch rocket systems, and jointly developing new high-tech weapons. In order to do this, we are using both existing facilities and newly created ones in safe locations. End quote. NATO nations have been very impressed with several Ukrainian weapon systems and their artillery fire control software. In our War Crimes and Human Rights segment, we discuss events that might be upsetting to hear about. There is minor graphic detail in today's report, and if you are sensitive to descriptions of human rights abuses, please feel free to skip ahead to the next segment. Timestamps are in the description. A graphic video has emerged, with Russia accusing Ukrainian forces of executing a squad of Russian soldiers in Luhansk. Some viewers may find the video disturbing, But if you do want to watch it, we do link to it in our full situation report on Patreon. Or, honestly, it's all over social media. In the 55-second clip, a squad of Ukrainian troops is capturing a group of Russian soldiers who are surrendering. Approximately 10 soldiers come out, one at a time, hands raised and unarmed, lying on the ground. Ukrainian troops call out and ask if anyone is left in the shed for them to come out. At the 49-second mark, with the soldiers still lying on the ground, an 11th, dressed in black, emerges and starts to fire at Ukrainian troops. The scene becomes chaotic, and the video implies that the first shots were fired in the direction of the person operating the camera. The person and camera fall to the ground, and later another video shows the entire Russian squad dead. The full video raises numerous questions— But after our review and a frame-by-frame analysis from 49 to 52 seconds, this was a perfidy case in our assessment. Perfidy is when a belligerent uses treachery to attack another force, including pretending to surrender. We shared numerous videos taken during mobilization and MOBIC training where Russian conscripts were instructed to use perfidy to pretend to surrender and kill Ukrainian troops. Ukrainian officials have not commented on the two videos or addressed the Russian accusation that a war crime was committed. Russian officials indicated that a prisoner exchange for WNBA player Brittany Griner could be in the works, as the Kremlin attempts to get notorious arms dealer Victor Bout, who was arrested in Bangkok, Thailand in 2008, released. Russia's deputy foreign minister, Sergei Ryabkov, said on Friday that Washington and Moscow are currently exploring a possible prisoner exchange for Greiner. 
Greiner was detained days before Russia's wide-scale invasion of Ukraine for possessing vape cartridges with hashish oil. She was sentenced to nine years in prison and was recently sent to a maximum security facility. Russia watchers said that her sentence and where she has been imprisoned was highly unusual for her crime. In Vilnyansk in the Zaporizhia Oblast, the death toll climbed to 10 after a Russian missile strike obliterated a two-story apartment building. There were no survivors, and three children were among the dead. War crimes investigators in Kherson found that Russian troops kept separate torture chambers for teenagers from 14 to 19 years of age. This hasn't been found in any other parts of Ukraine. The torturers kept surveillance cameras in each detention area and torture chamber. Investigation into Russian war crimes continues throughout the region. In geopolitical news, the European Parliament will vote on November 23rd on whether to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. This is the same Russia negotiating for the return of an arms dealer nicknamed the Merchant of Death, who is convicted for supplying terrorist organizations worldwide. Mm -hmm. There would be a second vote on an 18 billion euro aid package for non-military assistance to Ukraine for the 2023 calendar year. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban said his nation would not support the financial aid package. He said he wasn't ready to put Ukraine's needs ahead of the need of his nation. Mateusz Morawiecki, the Prime Minister of Poland, told European Pravda that, quote, Today there is only one way to drag Poland into the war, namely to turn one's back on Ukraine. If Ukraine becomes dependent, we will not even need to do anything to provoke war. It will come to us by itself. Putin will not stop, and the Kremlin will go further. Being passive is suicide for us. End quote. Morawiecki added that he believes the missile that crashed into Poland further proves that Ukraine needs more military support. Russian publication Medusa reported that the oligarch class within the Russian Federation is beginning to declare the war in Ukraine a lost cause. One person in Putin's inner circle said, quote, There is an understanding. We lost the real war. People begin to think about how to live on, what place they would like to take in the future, what bet to make. End quote. The Kremlin is continuing to bet that a cold European winter, a Republican House in the United States, and war fatigue will collapse Ukrainian military support. At least one United States congressperson would love to see that support end. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, stalked a group of wounded Ukrainian soldiers visiting the U.S. Capitol and filmed them. She wrote on Twitter, quote, it is heartbreaking to see these disabled Ukrainian soldiers here in the halls of Congress being used as pawns to pressure our Congress to give America's hard-earned tax dollars to Zelensky, end quote. Green and several other Trump-aligned far-right Republicans have stated they would end Ukrainian financial aid as part of their 2023 agenda. Other party members in the House and Senate have expressed they would support continuing aid. The Center for European Policy Analysis released an analysis of the cost of supporting Ukraine to United States taxpayers and concluded it is, quote, costing peanuts for the defeat of Russia. The analysis went on to say, quote, keeping up with the new arms race that it has now triggered with the West will surely end up bankrupting the Russian economy, especially an economy subject to aggressive Western sanctions. How can Russia possibly hope to win an arms race when the combined GDP of the West is $40 trillion? End quote. The report concluded, quote, Continued U.S. support for Ukraine is a no-brainer from a bang-for-buck perspective. Ukraine is no Vietnam or Afghanistan for the U.S., but it is exactly that for Russia. A Russia continually mired in a war it cannot win is a huge strategic win for the U.S. End quote. Ukrainian President Zelensky reported cracks were forming in Africa's continued political support for Russia. He cited delays in grain shipments and Russia's conduct when they attempted to end the grain deal on October 30th. Zelensky said, quote, Today, gradually, country by country, the states of the African continent are beginning to understand what happened, that they were misinformed, that Russia is really an aggressor, that it does not respect freedom, does not support life, but does the opposite. 
Several countries on the African continent have started to support us. End quote. In economic news, Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey have agreed to extend the Black Sea Grain Initiative for four more months, with the United Nations and Turkey continuing their role as guarantors of the deal. Ukraine has requested that negotiations continue to extend the deal through 2023. Russian airline Aeroflot has been forced to ground 25% of its fleet, mostly comprising of Western aircraft from Boeing and Airbus, that were essentially stolen in March. Approximately 50 aircraft are grounded due to a lack of parts or because they are being cannibalized to keep other aircraft flying. Aeroflot has agreed to return four grounded airbuses to the lesser. While some parts and systems are significant, including engines and auxiliary power units, other aircraft are grounded due to worn-out tires and brake linings. The ruble closed the week down with an exchange rate of 61 for one U.S. dollar. Global oil prices continued to drift closer to $85 a barrel, the critical benchmark for Russian oil sales to be profitable on the world market. WTI crude fell to $80 a barrel, and Brent dropped to 87 United States wholesale RBOB gasoline on the spot market dropped to $2.42 per gallon for November contracts, that's 64 cents a liter. Dutch TTF gas futures for December 2022 had another volatile trading session, ending the week down at 109 euros per megawatt hour. January 2023 contracts were unchanged, trading at 117 euros. Chicago SRW wheat futures closed the week down sharply, falling to $8.02 a bushel for March 2022 contracts. And that's what we know. Join me again on Monday for more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.